Has this been an amazing day? Yeah. Yes, it has. So I'm so thrilled to be sharing the stage with Dr. Harvey Karp. Um, I think that many of us, myself included, who've been uh, in that position of being brand new parents, desperately trying to soothe a newborn or get it to sleep or It's the negotiate. position right after being, the position of being a new parent, right? That's yeah. a different, slightly different position. It's different every day, <laughs> yeah. right? Also the whole negotiating the transition into being a parent at all. Um, and what I found uh, so useful about your techniques was not only that they were useful, but that they were validating. Um, that you really, you read through them and you can picture them working for anyone, anywhere, right? And that really speaks to, I think, the universality of the experiences of new parents. Um, and that universality is, of course, why we're, why we're here today. Exactly. Um, and in light of that, let me say, and maybe this has been said already today, I don't know, but, or maybe you've heard this before, but Kassarian and Gera, which is the Maasai greeting for when you meet somebody for the first time or when you meet someone that you know. And it means, how are the children? They, the Maasai don't ask, um, how's business? How you doing? You know, they ask, how are the children? And there's only one acceptable answer to that, which is, all the children are fine. Not my kids are fine, my child is fine, all the children are fine, because ultimately, that is the sign of health for your community, and that is the sign of prosperity and happiness. And so, Kasarian and Gera. It's a great mantra for a parent as well, as well as the kids are going to be all right. I right. say that to myself all the time, the kids are going to be all right. <laughs> so my first question to you is, um, I know that I, as well as a lot of my students, have voiced this sort of desire when they're expecting or when they're brand new parents, not necessarily to be the best parent in the world, right? Not mm -hmm. to be incredible, but just to be a normal parent, mm -hmm. right? Not to inflict a whole lot of damage. <laughs> so is there any such thing as a normal parent? You know, everybody prays for that. I just want to have a normal child. I just want to be normal. And having seen thousands, because I've been a pediatrician for, for well over 30 years, there is no such thing as a normal family. Well, I should say the only normal family is the one you don't know very well. Right, because everybody's got a story. The more you talk to people, there is no, there's not a single family that has 2.1 children. You know, it just doesn't exist. And, um, and you ask people, and then you find out about birth trauma, or then you find out about depression, or the colicky baby, or they lost a brother when they were young, or um, you know, the issues that people have in underdeveloped nations. You learn about the struggles that they have because of poverty or food insecurity or infectious disease and the problems that we have in developed countries because we have tremendous poverty here, especially in terms of poverty of childcare. Um, even in the best family. I mean, the whole idea of a mother and a father taking care of a child, right? That's normal, right? Oh, you know, and mom is at home cooking the, you know, the, the, making the cookies, and you have a dog, and you have a nursery that's beautiful that you put the baby in. That's not normal. That is so impoverished, you can't even believe it. Because what's normal is to have your aunts and your older daughters and your next door neighbor's older daughters and your cousins and your mother and your grandmother and have that richness of society around us. So the more we have this global discussion, I think the more we appreciate each other's differences and understand those differences and then join together to, to bridge and see what our commonalities are. So I think another concept that I hear a lot and I think that it's meant to be a really positive concept um, but I find that it can be um, a, a little undermining as well as this concept of maternal instinct, right? And it's, it's actually come up on stage a whole bunch of times today. One of our very first speakers, Carolyn Miles from Save the Children, talked about this fierce determination, right? Really beautiful phrase that all mothers feel to mm -hmm. do the best they can do for their children, mm -hmm. right? To make sure their children are healthy and happy and have a good life. And yet new parenthood can also be so incredibly difficult and challenging and leading, I think, new mothers to sometimes feel like, why isn't my instinct just serving up the proper thing to do at all times? Sure. Where is that disconnect? And, sure. and is it only that individual mother? Sure. And that's such a beautiful way to put it about that fierce determination. Because life will deal you all sorts of, you know, difficulties, uh, bumps in the road. And um, what was that saying I heard? It's not how far you go, but how high you bounce. You know, not how far you drop, but how high you bounce, that kind of thing. Um, it turned, I mean, at least in my experience, um, the idea of maternal instinct 
is, is very valid in the sense that you have this incredible drive to take care of your child. That is intuitive, that's automatic. Most of the time, even an amazing love for your child. Not always, sometimes that takes a little time to develop, but for most women, it's there right boom, kind of magically in the beginning. However, the skill to take care of a child is not at all intuitive. In fact, much of it is counterintuitive. And so what I find happens a lot, um, especially in our culture, is that people think that it's just gonna be automatic. Just trust yourself. That's what Dr. Spock said, trust yourself. Well, if you've been around 20 babies when you were growing up and you took care of your nieces and nephews and your little siblings and things like that, okay, then trust yourself. But if you haven't had that experience, and it's even worse today for mothers in our culture, because mothers and fathers, because not only do we not have that, extent, that experience growing up, most of us, not only are we ripped away or do we divorce ourselves from our extended family, so we don't have that, you know, those uh, decades of uh, wisdom to rely upon. But parents today in our culture are trained that success means doing well in school or at work. And those are very linear, problem-solving kind of um, uh, challenges that we have. Having a, taking care of a child, especially a baby, it's circular. That's, you know, 5 a.m. is no different than 5 p.m. It's like living in a Las Vegas casino. You know, morning and night, it's the same. You know, didn't I just change your diaper? Didn't I just feed you? I, I mean, am I losing my mind? If you give in to that, then that's fine. But if you think you're going to organize it and then in the afternoon you're going to send out your baby announcements and all that kind of stuff, then you get to be really, really um, frustrated with it. And so, so I find that while the love is instinctual and the desire is instinctual, the skill set is not complicated. But that is not instinctual. That, that needs to be learned. Right, and that trust yourself thing can be so tricky. If you have a baby who's screaming and you can't make it stop, then you're saying to yourself, I can't be trusted. Right? Well, yeah, no, right. that's a, very well put, yeah. Um, so let's talk about some of the challenges that are sort of universally faced by, by new mothers. And I think one um, that really bears mentioning is postpartum depression. It seems like there's a lot more awareness than there, than there ever has been mm -hmm. about, about PPD. Um, but still some, some serious misconceptions, and I think one of them is that it's a, a Western disease, mm -hmm. that, it's, that it's experienced by women um, you know, in elite communities, women who have you know, the luxury of the time to feel the baby blues, and, and in reality, the data doesn't back that up at all, right? It's very pervasive in developing countries, and, um, and, and that you know, sort of indicates that there are some really common universal root causes and, and solutions, one would hope. It's exactly right. So, um, so when you're looking at the skill set that's involved, and how does that, as a matter of fact, I just came from New Orleans just the other day where I presented to the American College of OBGYNs about prevention of postpartum depression. For more than a decade, we physicians are talking about early diagnosis. Screen women for it, diagnose it early, put them on medication, send them to psychotherapy or support groups. And that's important. I, I wouldn't at all poo-poo that. But we're talking about anywhere from 10 to 30% of the population of new mothers. And we do see in other cultures that the numbers can be as high. Because what happens is that any stresses can push you in that direction. Poverty, pain after childbirth, ill health, um, you know, uh, spousal conflicts. And those are things you can't do a lot about. Well, I mean, we can't wave a wand to make everybody rich or give them all the food they need, that kind of thing. But there are three things that we can do that are dramatically effective at uh, reducing postpartum depression and supporting women. And those three things are reducing infant crying, increasing maternal sleep, and increasing the support that mothers get from their partners or their support group. And the way you do those things is by teaching families the skills. So what we're we talking about, the things that don't come naturally, you teach families the skills to calm a crying baby, the skills to add an hour or two sleep to the baby's night, and the skills to have other members of the family be every bit as good at calming the baby and taking care of that part of baby care um, as the mother is. Because honestly, and this is an interesting thing, I know what you've got on your list, we're going to talk about fathers, but I'm going to jump there right now which is I just came back now, and I was just rushing here. I'm sorry I missed um, uh, the earlier part of the day. My wife is going, did you meet J-Lo? Did you see, see Turlington? <laughs> uh, um, and, um, 
And so I was just at Joint Base uh, McGuire in New Jersey. I do a lot of work with the US military. I do a lot of work with fathers groups because it turns out that men, by and large, I mean, I think that this is a general universal statement. Men are pretty terrible at breastfeeding. I mean, we're not good but we're really damn good at baby calming. In fact, in many families, I don't know about in yours, but in many families, men are actually even better than the women because swaddling is an engineering job and we can shush loud and women sometimes don't want to shush loud enough. And so, um, and so by building these skill sets, and, and so in my work through The Happiest Baby, it's been this idea of the five S's which imitate the baby's experience in the womb. So that's um, swaddling, the side stomach position, shushing, swinging, and sucking. And those are things, when I wrote this book and made this DVD and I was doing my research, I was learning, matter of fact, the reason I wrote this was because I learned about the Kung San tribe, the Kung San tribe in South Africa. And they had been studied by anthropologists. They could calm their crying babies in under a minute, 95% of the time. Now, in my training, which wasn't bad, I mean, I trained up here at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx, and I learned that if a baby cries a lot, you go for a car ride, or you walk around the block, or if that's not working, I was trained to prescribe either phenobarbital for the baby, and then the mother took a little too sometimes, <laughs> phenobarbital, op um, para uh, phenobarbital um, um, or paragoric. Paragoric is a mixture of opium and Jack Daniels. We were routinely treating babies with opium, routinely, in our culture, just 35 years ago. And, um, and it, it kind of worked uh, to knock them out, and unfortunately some babies died from it because they couldn't breathe. Yeah, but the, the point being that, that we have evolved and that as I started to study this process and I learned about the, um, the Kung San, I had been trained to tell people that 15% of babies will cry three hours a day. That's what we call colic. And in our culture, that's correct. But then here, these mothers could calm their babies in under a minute. So either those babies were like mutant babies, you know, those, those Kung San babies, or we forgot something. We left something behind. And that really was kind of the impetus for my book, was to study other cultures and see what could we recapture from other cultures so we could be more successful in ours. Well, one thing that seems like has changed or, and that is different around the world is that women are often not living with their families, right? And so they, they lose that sort of connection or near their families, near their mothers, near their grandmothers. And so they lose that sort of you know, parental and grandparental wisdom that's passed down from generation to generation. Exactly right. And then sometimes, even when they're with their grandparents, their grandparents don't know. I mean, so if, for example, look at the Chinese situation. It's been a long time that there's been a one-child policy in China. The grandparents no longer have baby skills. So everybody's kind of bumping in the dark. I mean, people, you know, of course, there's a tremendous amount of love and attention and holding, which is very important. But these particular skills, and it turns out with the five S's, it's based upon, this was never known before the work came out, but it's based upon a reflex. That babies have a relative off switch for crying and on switch for sleep. And to stimulate a reflex, like if I want to knock your knee, I'd, oh, it worked. I'd hit your, I'd hit your leg in the, in the right place. But what would happen if I hit your knee and I'm off by two inches? Or even if I hit in the right place too softly? Would I get half a reflex or nothing? Well, the answer is nothing. Reflexes are all or none. And that's kind of why with the five S's, and actually it's why we made a DVD, because if you don't do these things correctly, then forget it. You're, you're actually going to make them cry more, not less. And so now I'll be going, for example, this summer, I'm going to be lecturing in Holland, in Germany, and in Bulgaria to help bring, it's kind of weird, you know, who, who am I? You know, this white Jewish guy from Queens. But, um, but the fact of the matter is that as a pediatrician, my job has been 20% doctoring and 80% grandmothering. I mean, literally, I've been a grandmother to thousands of families because they didn't have their grandmother who could pass this information along to them. Wow. Um, we are, I can't believe it, almost already running out of time, but I want to touch on um, your post for the Global Mom Relay was on vaccination. And I wonder, when you travel all over the world, what is your perception of the, the difference in attitudes of mothers elsewhere toward vaccines and the mothers that you treat here in the States? Oh my God, what a great question. I mean, it is enormous. 
Because when you live in a culture where these infectious diseases are more prevalent, you are on your hands and knees, you know, giving praise to God that we have these vaccines. Um, and it isn't even that long ago in our culture. I mean, like I said, I grew up in Queens, and, and as I wrote in my blog post, a good friend of mine, a childhood friend, had polio. It was, he got polio in one of the last polio outbreaks in New York City. And, and polio was just a cold. It's just actually an intestinal virus. Most people just get diarrhea or got nothing, no symptoms whatsoever. And then suddenly this person would lose the use of their limb or this person would lose the use of all musculature and could barely breathe. And we had iron lungs and things like that. Um, so it's amazing how quickly we forget our vulnerability to those things. And then suddenly we're going, well, I don't need these vaccines because of the potential side effects. Of course, there are potential side effects to any treatment, but you have to weigh the societal benefits and you have to thank Mothers today have to thank mothers from five years ago and 20 years ago for getting all their kids immunized because that's why we don't have a lot of polio and you know, reduced meningitis and reduced whooping cough today. It's because of parents making those right decisions. So people around the world are so incredibly appreciative of vaccinations and we need to be in this, in this country as well and really keep up with that because not just for our kids, but for our neighbors' kids and for the next generation. So what do you say to the mothers here who come to you with concerns about possible links between vaccines and autism uh, beyond there's no data to, to show that there is a link? Well, no, there's a lot of data now. So, so that has actually been a problem of Western medicine. We were not fast enough off the ball to really get the data out there to reassure parents. That was partly our responsibility. The data is there now. There's lots of data. There's no association that's been demonstrated between any vaccines and autism. Meanwhile, we know that many of these childhood illnesses can actually cause brain damage. So, you know, clearly the net positive is to do vaccines. Having said that, my job is to encourage parents to ask, I want people to ask questions. I don't want them just to take things at face value. On the other hand, you're not a biologist, you're not a biochemist, and it's not your job. You know, you have a much more important job. You got to cook the food, put it on the table, coach your soccer team, you know, take your kids out and run around in the park. So, so part of that is a trust relationship. And what I try to do with my patients is demonstrate to them my respect and my study, my, my you know, kind of uh, interest in these issues that they question, that they're interested in, so that they can say, okay, you know what, nobody can know everything, but I will trust you enough because you've earned that trust and I have to trust somebody because I cannot manage this all on my own. Will you share with the audience that what you were saying to me backstage about the Jenga game? Yeah, about Jenga. You guys know what that game is? It's a tower of wooden pegs. So when I think of my work, and especially the work I'm doing now, we talked about the baby work. Actually, for me, and many of you may not know this, but my, what's more important to me even than the baby work is my work with toddlers because you have a difficult baby, you have depression. Most, pretty much, you're going to get through it after four months, five months. But the way you raise your toddler, the emotional development of that toddler, that's going to affect them for the rest of their lives. And so my toddler work actually, for me, is really super important. So my job, as I see it, is to play this game of Jenga or to work with the game of Jenga that our culture is playing. Our culture, and really all cultures around the world, had this beautiful tower that we take pegs away from, right? Now you don't know your next door neighbor. Now you can't let your child go out and play in the community the way you could 50 years ago. Now we have more single parent mothers or two worker families or you're not around your extended family or you have colicky babies or postpartum depression. Well, eventually you, you start taking all these pegs away and the whole thing's gonna collapse. And we're getting to that danger point you know, with social, you know, the exposure to, to electronic media and all sorts of things that are threatening our families today. So I'm just trying to jam a couple of sticks in there, you know, with reducing colic and helping toddler behaviors. And immunizations are another stick that we're trying to push in there to just make families healthier. Okay, 100 words or less since we're out of time. What did you learn from your own mom that influences your work? in honor of Mother's Day, this question. Yes, in honor of my mother, who, who died about 20 years ago. So I, I, I um, honor her memory by, well, one thing, I mean, she taught me many, many things, of course, but one thing that I always remember is that um, don't be afraid of change. She would say things either change or rot. 
You know, so you take a choice, you know, but don't be, don't be stuck in, in your ways because it's only through change that we really mature and develop. Love it. All yeah, right. Thanks. Thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you, Asha. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you to the UN and Johnson & Johnson and to Huffington Post and to my friends at Baby Center for uh, helping me be part of this. Thanks. <laughs>